I hope you enjoy this talk, but the point is that it is, I have a lesson to teach you, and that is, it is not what I know that brings me here, it's who I know that brings me here. And this is a sad lesson for young physicists, that it is, you are going to be successful maybe more for who you know than what you know, but you better learn it now. I, I'm going to read some of, uh, because the lights are out, you won't be able to read the board, and I will read the board a little bit now, and, and uh, Joseph will, uh, I, I'm here because of him and because of Slavo Tuleya, and because they wrote to me a much longer and much more polite and much more competent email than he has, has uh, said generously. So first of all, it is not what I know, it is who I know. All right. And together we did do a series of papers. One, one, they were generally on the principle of least action. Um, and Landau and Lifshitz, in their famous mechanics book, does not use Newtonian mechanics. They use the principle of least action as the beginning, the fundamental idea of, uh, of mechanics. And Richard Feynman, in his QED, uh, has the same principle uh, has the same principle of least action. And I'm going to talk today about the principle of maximal aging. It is one of the three things that we use in general relativity, the principle of maximal aging. That's how things move so as to maximize their wristwatch time. But for low speeds and flat space time, the principle of maximal aging be becomes the principle of least action. There are some questions that I will not answer in this talk. And after it, I don't know the custom of your country, but when the talk is over, everybody can leave except those who want to hear about this question and maybe some others that you have. One of the questions is, general re relativity uses tensors. Why does it have to use tensors? Why can't it just use vectors the way all reasonable people think? It's got to be tensors. Why? I will not answer that question during the talk. And I'm going to talk a lot about global coordinates and that you get to choose them. And almost anything you want, you can use as a global coordinate. And Einstein will tell you what the metric is. Why almost? That's the question I will not answer during the talk. So we start. Um, and this is a book that has been published in the first edition in English in two, the year 2000. And we are, un, we are doing it again. And my co-author is Edmund Birchinger. And, he, and here is John Wheeler. I had, when I was a junior faculty member at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, a year sabbatical. And I, began, I helped him teach a course. And from, I was so astonished at the way he did special relativity that uh, I wrote them up. And this has recently been translated into Slovak, and it is special relativity, this book. It is not the general relativity that is the, sub the primary subject of this talk. And this is John Wheeler, who has since died, and he and I produced the first edition of this book. And he, was bo he is a, a, a name you have perhaps heard of. He was born in 1911 in Florida, he graduated from college at age 15, and he got his doctoral degree at 22. And then he went to the Copenhagen Institute with Niels Bohr. And by the 1939, they analyzed fission that led to the, nuclear, the first nuclear weapon. In the 1940s, he was involved in constructing the Hanford nuclear reactors, which created plutonium for the second nuclear bomb. The first nuclear bomb was uranium-235, and the second nu nuclear bomb was, was uh, 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 plutonium. And in the 1950s, he was a very warlike person. He worked for the government. He made weapons. He was not apologetic about this. And uh, he was in on the design of the hydrogen bomb in the 1950s. And then we get to the general relativity part. He was a nuclear physicist, and he then began general relativity. Now, at that time, general relativity was not very respectable. It was a beautiful theory that had to be true, 
Oppenheimer said, it is so beautiful, it has to be true. But no, nobody had mastered it and applied it. And what you now know about cosmology and the great, uh, uh, this, we live in a golden age of cosmology in part because Wheeler's paid attention to general relativity. He coined the term, uh, whoop, excuse me, I'm pushing the wrong button here. He coined the term wormhole and he chose the name black hole. He was giving a talk and he said, we cannot go on talking about completely collapsed stars. That's too long. And somebody in the audience said, how about black hole? We don't know who it was. And he said, that's it, because he had been looking for it. One of the things he did was to try to think about simple names. And every school child know, in, in the world knows the term black hole, because he chose it. And then he and I produced um, Exploring Black Holes. It was with the first edition. And he died in April of 2008. He was 96 years old. We should all have such a good life. Wheeler, there are many Wheeler stories. And if you want to hear many, read many of them, you have to go to the website that I will show you at the end. I could spend the whole hour talking about Wheeler stories, but I will give you only a few. He said, I'm against logic. And his idea was the textbook writer knows where he wants to go and he grabs you by the collar and pretends to use logic to get you there. But that's disgraceful, it's dishonest. And what Wheeler preferred was a kind of Hegel, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. So you have Newton standing in the, uh, on the solar system together with Galileo behind him and Einstein on the other side and they're shouting at the planets about how to move, right? And uh, Galileo was sort of right and Newton was right except for a little thing about Mercury and Einstein won, but it was this thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and it's, uh, it's not communism, but it's Hegel. And then Wheeler also said from Bohr, genius is the ability to make all possible mistakes in the least possible time. It's okay to make mistakes, make them fast, understand them, get over them, and go on to the next thing. And you will see many Wheeler stories in, in Anatomy of Collaboration and Space Time Interview, which are on a website I will show you at, at, at the end of the talk. So this is the second edition, which I am writing with Edmund Birchinger. Edmund Birchinger is the head of the chairman of the Department of Physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Every collaboration is different. And uh, Birchinger is very straightforward. I write up a, a piece and he writes false, false, misleading. And there's nothing antagonistic about it. He is not criticizing me. He's just saying it's wrong. And uh, I like, I, I, at the beginning, I didn't like this. But now I want to hug him because it is perfectly straightforward. And an experimental physicist will work a whole year before nature tells him he's wrong, right? I know in 20 seconds that I'm wrong. So, whoop. So we're, we're going to talk about the simplest structure in the whole universe. In a way, it's very simple. In a way, it's very complicated. But what's simple about it is everything follows from one number, the mass. Even the hydrogen atom doesn't do, isn't that simple. Just one number, it's mass. And that is the non-rotating black hole. There are very few non-rotating black holes in the universe, and I can tell you why. Because black holes condense from a cloud, and there's always a little bit of angular momentum. And, and when you are a skater going around and you pull your arms in, the closer you can pull it in, the smaller the final uh, structure, the faster you spin. And the smallest structure in the universe is the black hole. So most black holes will spin, and we do get to the, to the spinning black hole at the end of our book. But you want to start with the simplest possible case, which is the non-spinning black hole. But even when you get to the spinning black hole, there are only two numbers, mass and spin. That's it. It's still simpler than the hydrogen atom. So the, these two structures, and this is the one we're going to pay attention to, it displays all possible curvatures. Small curvature if you're far away 
and unlimited curvature when you get to the center of the black hole. So we've got the whole range of curvatures, and this is going to be the thing we carefully pursue. So why is general relativity so complicated? Why do you have to use tensors? What's, all, what's going on? The reason is, the first reason is, the effects are nonlinear. In Newton, you have twice the mass, you have twice the attraction. A million times the mass, a million times the attraction. And with some simplification, the same is true for Maxwell's equations. It's a little more complicated, but it, basically it's linear. Whereas general relativity is nonlinear. That's it's the, first, the first reason it's complicated. You double the mass and you more than double the attraction because pressure is part, is adds to the mass of, a, of, a, of an object. You, you have one million times the mass, you have way more than a million times the attraction. And finally, at some point, gravity runs away. You get more mass, more pressure, you get, and that causes con contraction, and you get more mass and more pressure, and finally it runs away until you have a black hole with an event horizon. The event horizon is nothing weird. It is simply that it takes, it takes a light moves slower and slower the closer you get to a, to a black hole. And therefore, at some point, it, it moves. The light speed is so slow that, no, that nothing can get away from that. The event horizon is just that point. All right. So there's only three, three key ideas of the book. The first is the metric with an arbitrary global coordinate. You choose them, it's up to you, almost arbitrary. They, that describes space-time. You can use any coordinate system you want. You submit it, well, we're gonna get to that in a minute. So that's the first thing that tells you what space-time is, but you wanna know how things move in space-time. And it's the principle of maximal aging that describes motion. And finally, since the coordinates are arbitrary, the difference in coordinates mean nothing. You chose the coordinates, so it's the difference between two coordinates has no meaning whatever. It was completely your choice. However, just an, uh, however, you can find a flat place. If you take a small enough region, it's essentially flat. The Earth is essentially flat in Slovakia, so you can use a flat road map and you don't get lost. And the same is true of space-time. So you make every measurement and observation on a local flat patch, and you can use special relativity. So that's, these are the key ideas of the book, and I'm going to go through them now uh, one at a time. Now, what's the key point of, of I would say, of physics, and maybe of all of science, and that the key point is events. And Wheeler says, events are like steel rods nailed into the ground, and everything else is paper mache. It's just strung between these fact, these events. The really key ideas are events, and I think, I'm not sure, but I think that follows all the way through physics, whether it be mechanics, electricity, magnetism. It's events that physics is about. So physics hangs on events. So here now is flat space-time and the, and the strangest equation in all of physics, to my mind. This is what you read on your wristwatch when you go from one event, bang, to another event, bang. It's what I read on my wristwatch. You, everybody's going to agree on that number. However, the coordinate system they use can be a laboratory frame. And it's the square of the time between those two events minus the square of the distance between those two events. Have you ever seen a stranger and simpler equation than that? I don't think there is any. So what's important is over here, invariant. Everybody, no matter what their reference frame, let me go to the next slide, you have an unpowered rocket tearing through this room, and the, t the distance between those two events will obviously be different. And what you didn't, may not have known before you studied special relativity is the time between them will be different, but the difference of those squares will always give you the same wristwatch time. I do not like the term wristwatch time. Germans are much smarter. They have Eigenzeit, which means your own personal time. That's a nice word. We don't have it. Maybe Slovak does. 
Mm -hmm. It goes like this. <laughs> so I think this is one of the great equations of physics. Now, you say E equals mc squared is the greatest of equation of physics. But if you read our book, you will see that it, come, it grows out of this equation. E equals mc squared grows out of this equation. So now, in order to make the book simple, you try to simplify as much as you can. And a theoretical physicist will say, S -s choose C, the speed of light, equal to 1. I don't like that. You don't get to choose the speed of light. What does it mean to choose the speed of light equal to 1? Well, it means you choose your coordinates so that your, uh, you measure distance in light years and time in years. So it's that both are in years. You use the same units or the distance in meters and the time in meters of light travel time. It takes light 3.34 times 10 to the minus 9 seconds to go one meter. That's your unit of time. And then you say, how fast am I moving? It's so many meters of distance per meter of time, and light moves one in those units, whether you use meters of distance and meters of light travel time, or light years and uh, years of time. So we're going to choose the energy of the stone in, in rest. Well, once you do this, the rest mass of the stone is m. There's usually a c squared there, but we're going to, if we use this method, we get rid of it. And finally, the black hole has mass in units of meters, and that's the, the gravitational constant times m in kilograms divided by c squared, and that simplifies all our equations, which is the point uh, of this exercise. So the book's fundamental strategy is you start with the metric equation, not with Einstein's equation. Because the metric equation, which we just saw for flat space time, has only differentials in it. That's all. There is no tensors. So you milk, so you, you use the metric equation and you milk each, oops, sorry, it's this pointer I want. You milk each metric relentlessly to derive the widest possible range of physical results. And if there's anything unique about our general relativity book, that's it. You need only the metric, which you're given. In the final chapter, we do construct Einstein's equations for simple systems. And if you're going to be a serious professional, you've got to take the next course, and you've got to use tensors and talk about what space-time really does. So here is the first metric we present, which is the metric for the non-spinning black hole. And on the left is our old favorite, wristwatch time. And, and uh, uh, Schwarzschild shows a set of coordinates. And he submitted these coordinates to Einstein's field equation. And he took the simplest ones he could think of, the most symmetric. And that gave him a simple metric. And, this, and so this second, the second two terms, if it were flat, would be ds squared, uh, which you recognize uh, from uh, polar coordinates. And this is for a plane, you want the simplest possible case. So you take a plane cutting right through, a slice cutting right through the center of a black hole. You don't worry about the third dimension, because once a particle starts to move around the black hole, it's going to stay in that plane. So it, it's like this. Here's Slovakia. You can use a flat road map. You don't get lost if you use a flat road map in Slovakia. It's good enough. Flat is good enough for, for a road map, but it's got to be only a small portion of the globe. If you try to get a big portion of the globe, like Africa or Europe or Asia or Russia, curv curvature matters, and, and you can't use a flat map. Or if you do, you've got to peel it like a lemon and, and, and make, make it stretch or contract. So we're going to talk about a series of local inertial frames that, that are flat enough so you can do a measurement in them. This is from the Montreal World's Fair, and you can see that it's the kind of sphere. We're going to build this sphere in imagination around a black hole. And we will have patches of it, like you have patches of, of Slovakia uh, on, the, uh, on, the, or on the curved Earth. Now, um, let's see what, nope, okay. If it's a small enough patch, then it's inertial. 
you've got, you, you're back to special relativity. And the rule for our textbook is you make every measurement and observation on a local flat patch where, spe where special relativity is the, uh, uh, and analyzes everything. Now the next seven slides are going to be technical. And there's two things you can do. You can go to sleep. Or you can do the best you can, and then we have this whole talk in Slovak, and you can go back and say, oh, that's what he meant. I didn't understand it at the time, but I apologize. It's going to be a little technical. And after the next seven slides, we will begin to have fun again. So let's suppose that we, that we make an approximation to the Schwarzschild metric. That is, we choose an average, oh, pushing the wrong button again. Um, we choose an average radius, and that tells us that we're near a certain radius in this shell around the black hole. So we're going to take an average, and therefore, and a, 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 a separation that is not a differential, but it's got a little elbow room, because I cannot do an experiment with a differential space. It goes to zero by definition. So you need a little elbow room, and I'm going to take something the size of this room and something that lasts as long as uh, throwing a ball in the air. So that's space-time. And, and, and this has a certain radius, namely the radius of the Earth. So here's an approximate metric, but this term is now a constant. It's not changing with radius because you're choosing an average radius. Now you can define a shell. A shell time is this constant times delta t. So you now have a shell you, in, instead of this, the square of this in here, you now have delta t, shell squared. There it is. And you take y in the r direction, and now you've got to the minus a half. You square that and subtract it from the first one, and you've got delta s shell, except del, delta s shell also has an r bar delta phi. This, I have now gone from a general equation, true anywhere outside a black hole, to an, an approximate equation that is true for an inertial frame on a shell surrounding the black hole. Now the principle of maximal aging. We know how to describe space-time, but we need to describe motion. There's no use having a curved space-time if you don't know how stones are going to move or how light is going to move. So let's talk about the, the I, I used to think that the twin paradox was poison and it was somehow ruining it, but the twin paradox is at the center of general relativity. So we're now talking about flat space time. This is a small inertial thing. And a, here you have a fraternal, we could say fraternal twins, a boy and a girl born together. And the boy is going to stay at home. His space, he's not going to change space. He's just going to wait there. And the girl is going to tear out to a distant star, all in flat space time, and come zipping back. And if, if you put that delta T and delta S in, in, the, in, the, in the girl, the girl goes from this event to that event, and the delta T is the separation in time, delta S is the separation in position, and the girl's wristwatch time will be shorter because you subtract the delta S. The boy's wristwatch time will be longer because he doesn't go anywhere. There's no delta S for him. So, so you say, how? what's natural motion? Natural motion is the one in which the wristwatch time is the maximum. So that's the way things move. That's the way stones move. It's the way un, uh, un, uh, uh, rockets without their rockets going move. So natural motion between two events is the world line with maximal aging. We have turned that around in flat space time. And for slow motion, that becomes the principle of least action, which is the beginning of the Landau and Lifshitz mechanics textbook. So this is, this is, a, this is a bit technical. And here, here, comes, here comes a stone diving into a black hole. There's an upper, there's an inertial frame here. There's an inertial frame here and the stone enters here and, and leaves here. You fix the t space and time of, uh, of, of this point. You fix the space and time of this point, 
and you fix, this is wrong here, this should be R coordinate, you fix the R coordinate and you vary the time coordinate to give you the maximal, uh, uh, the maximal wristwatch time. Here's the total from the higher, from the lower, you take the derivative, you, you go and you set that equal to zero to find the maximum, and, uh, and it gives you now a constant of the motion. E over m is one minus two m over r d t d tau. What's that? Well, if, if you have no, if you're either very far away or you have no mass, then that just becomes E over m is d t d tau, and that's the special relativity expression for energy. So this must be the general expression, general relativity expression for energy. And now you see we're back to equal sign and differentials. And so we can say it starts out with a certain energy. It's going to keep that energy. It's a constant of the motion. So let's talk about a raindrop. Well, how do we define a raindrop? A raindrop is something that starts very high and drops from rest. That's why we call it a raindrop, so you remember. Ah, it's something that starts far away at rest and falls. So it's something that starts far from the black hole, and far from the black hole, space-time is flat. So E over M is 1, far from the black hole, and it's, that must be E over M, and that's equal to the uh, constant of motion, the energy. So that's one equation in three unknowns, dt, d tau, and dr. Here's the second equation with d phi is equal to zero. And there's no R bar here. This happens for the whole space time around a non-spinning black hole. So you've got two equations and three unknowns, dt, d tau, and dr, because you know what R is at any particular moment in any particular event. So there, we get to choose which one we want to eliminate. Let's eliminate d tau first. The result is you get an equation of motion, dr dt, is equal to 1 minus 2m over r times 2m over r to the 1 half. Well, it goes to infinity at that r equals 0. I don't know what happens at, at r equals 0. That's the center of the black hole. But it also goes to 0 at r equals 2m. And that doesn't work. You say something that falls toward a black hole is going to stop at the event horizon where r equals 2m. It can't stop there, although I have friends and colleagues who believe it does stop there. But that's just the coordinate system. That's a disease. That's a disease in time. The stone. So this is this is this is a prediction from our arbitrary coordinate system at, that has a diseased time coordinate. So it's a Schwarzschild coordinate singularity. It's not a physical singularity. Well, you, well. So let's go back. Remember, we we got to choose one of these. You can eliminate one of these instead of de eliminating dt. Let's eliminate dr. I'm sorry, D let's eliminate dt since it's such a troublesome fellow. And so we now have dr dt is 2m over r to the 1 half. This says you will fall a certain increment of, of radius in a wristwatch time. And your wristwatch goes right on running when you fall through, this, through the event horizon. Doesn't matter. You're, you're still ticking away. Maybe you're dead soon, but on the way through the event horizon, your wristwatch just keeps going in the usual way. So the Schwarzschild t-coordinate is diseased, and we've got to choose another t-coordinate. For example, we could say we're going to take, you can be at any radius, a, a, a raindrop goes by, there's a certain dt raindrop, and that's the time I'm going to use for my global coordinate. And that leads to a, a, a different uh, a metric, which I'm not going to go into here, but it leads, to a noble, uh, a, uh, it leads to a set of global coordinates such that it's reasonable. It just falls to the center, as you expect. So the crucial point here is that global coordinates are arbitrary. We choose them. And there's an infinite number of possible global coordinates. You choose what you want. You, once you've chosen those, you choose the coordinates, you submit them to Einstein's field equation, and the field equation returns you a, met a metric. If you have a messy set of coordinates, you're going to get a messy metric. If you simplify, simplify down to the, to the uh, uh, symmetries of the, of, the machine, of the object itself, you're going to get a, a cleaner coordinate. Einstein doesn't care. He'll, he'll provide you with a metric no matter what your global coordinates are. 
So the results of an arbitrary global coordinate is the global coordinate separations that doesn't tell us anything. We chose them. The separations could, are essentially under our control. So it doesn't tell us anything about the measured time or distance between events. So the global coordinates are useless. Indeed, they're dangerous. So what good are they? Well, first of all, they give you constants of motion, angular momentum, and energy. These are global coordinate constants of motion. So the strategy is you use global coordinates to connect local inertial frames, but you make every measurement and observation on a local flat patch where special relativity rules. And you say, I'm, I make an observation on Earth, and I've got a global positioning satellite up there, and it's moving, it's ticking at a certain wristwatch time. What, do, what signals do I receive down here? Because that's all you want to know. You want to know, given the signals you get down here, what does that mean is happening up there? And that's how your global positioning system works. So we make all measurements in a flat patch, and we can be completely relaxed. We can go anywhere. We can fall into the black hole, and until the last minute, we'll get to that soon, until the last minute, we're completely comfortable because we're floating around in an inertial frame. However, as the closer you get to the center of the black hole, the more restricted flatness is. You, you can't, sooner or later, tides are going to kill you. And how do you die at the center of a black hole? Because your feet are pulled more strongly than your head. And so you're pulled this way, and you're funneling into a, a smaller and smaller angle, and so you get pushed this way. We say you are spaghettified. You're turned into spaghetti as you go, as you reach the center of the black hole. And then inside the event horizon, we also must move inward. That follows if you, uh, if you consider the uh, logic of it. Now, how are you going to think about this? How are you going to practice it? And Slavo Tuleya, who's sitting here in the second row, has made an absolutely marvelous interactive um, uh, set of uh, uh, interactive software in which you can set, this is for a spinning black hole, He's spinning, he's, this is spinning at three quarters of the maximum, and here is the angular momentum of the stone, L over M, and here, and, and here is the, he set the value of that, and then he says go, and the thing moves back and forth. Well, why, why is this? I'm not going to go into it. It's, it's effective potential. You see a similar thing in Newtonian mechanics when you talk about orbits. And then you can try it with light. Now, with Newtonian mechanics, you can only use stones. But with general relativity, this will either plot the, the orbits of stones or the orbits of light. So this is the way you build intuition. It develops student intuition about orbiting stones and light. Newtonian trajectories and orbits of stones, but general relativistic trajectories of stones and light are both not, are around both non-spinning and spinning black holes. Now I want to go move on a little bit to the way we write, not the content, but how we write. And I've already talked about uh, he's, ag he's against logic. Here's some more rules. Every time you, every sentence, you should have a motivation. Why? You want people on the edge of their chair saying, woo, I didn't know that. What happens next? And it's hard to do, let me tell you, but you want to motivate all the time. You want to simplify. Now, Einstein says, make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. So you have to find the simplest possible um, um, way of expressing things. And you use active verbs and the present tense and singular things. You don't say black holes. You say the black hole. And that makes you think of a particular one. And it, it's much more lively. It's always present tense. You don't say we used to think. We say we, uh, unless you think it was wrong. We used to think something that's wrong. And, you, and this is a big surprise to me. Avoid ing words and past tense and subjunctive mode. You, you say some, sometimes people used to think that, but they were wrong. That's the only time. You, one might think that you want to do this. That's subjunctive. You don't use that unless you're trying to say that it's incorrect. Also, in this text, there are no abbreviations whatsoever with one exception. 
You don't say M. What does M mean? Does it mean mass? Does it mean meters? What does S mean? Does it mean distance? Does it mean seconds? So we spell out everything, meters, seconds, completely with one exception. And that is foot, and that is uh, some subscripts. You, you can say DS subcon, meaning conventional units. And so the subscripts, some, not all, not usually, but sometimes you use contractions in the subscripts. And you use what we call self-descriptive terms, like wristwatch time. Ah, I know what that means. It's time on my wristwatch between two events. You say black hole, not frozen star. What does a frozen star mean? You say wristwatch time and not proper time. Is there an improper time? What does proper time mean? Does it mean I'm polite? I don't know. We use wristwatch time. We use ruler distance, not proper distance. And we talk about the shell observer, the orbiting observer, the diving observer. They're all local inertial frames in which general relativity tells us what's going on. Our idea is this prevents what we call hiccups. You run into proper time. Now let me see what does proper time mean. I've got to go back and figure it out. But if you say wristwatch time, people know what you're talking about. So it, Hiccups force the reader to pause and recall the meaning of a term that isn't self-descriptive. So the, and there always has to be a story. And the major story of the book is, what is it like to fall into a black hole? How long does it take? Are you comfortable? When do you get uncomfortable? I'll tell you the answer for a non-spinning black hole. You're uncomfortable for two ninths of a second. Two ninths of a second. That would be a very nice way to die, it seems to me. And it doesn't matter how big the black hole is. It's always two ninths of a second if it's a non-spinning black hole. So we have different observers. The shell observer is like us on Earth. You say, that's not inertial. Well, either you're using high-speed particles that, that go through the detector so fast that gravity doesn't have a chance to take advantage of it, or you drop, you just pull the floor away for a tenth of a second, finish your experiment, and then stop on, a shell, on the floor below. So it's the orbiter, he rides in a stable circular orbit, a diver plunges in, inward. And what does each of these observers see? Well, that means you've got to answer the question, what are the orbits of light around the black hole? There's a wonderful uh, short story by Larry Niven called Neutron Star, which shows the importance of tides in, in, in uh, general relativity. And tides is really all, all we mean about general, uh, about gravity. So after we've done the non-spinning black hole, we use the tools to talk about the spinning black hole. And that's even wilder, because you're forced to go around the spinning black hole. But I'm, I don't have time for that here. You'll have to read our, uh, our, our book and find out about that. So I'm going go, to go back to the plunging into the non-spinning black hole. And there's one final thing you have to know, and that is called aberration. If, if you're sitting in a car, and rain is coming down from the back, rain comes down from the back, then if, then if you move the car forward at 60 miles an hour, the rain seems to come from the front. Is it really coming from the front? Well, yes, in your frame it really is coming from the front. But it came from a cloud that may have been back here and the wind blew it. Now the aberration of light is numerically different, but the effect is the same. So that for a fast enough speed, light from almost every star appears to come from in front of you. And if you talk about flat space time and you accelerate to very high speed, all the light from all the stars appears to come from in front of you, even though you might say when you stop with respect to those stars, that they will be uniformly distributed. So here's the trajectories of light, and, and we take several chapters, and I'm not going to uh, say too much about it, but in addition, here, here's a star and here's a local shell frame just sitting there. It's, they're going to see the star somewhere off in this direction. And if you're diving in, well, you'll see it from a little forward because of aberration. And in addition to the direct image, there's, there's secondary images. And when you go into the details, what happens is star, the starlight can go into an unstable orbit at one and a half times the, the radius of the, of the horizon. And then it can come off anywhere. So you, you, have a, you can see this star A 
You can see several images of it. It may go around and hit you here. It may go around several times and hit you here. So you have not only the direct beam, but the beam that uh, is involved in going around several times. And of course, here's star B over here, and it light, it lights def, uh, light is deflected toward you. And then if you're coming tearing in, it will seem even more toward the front. So local observers see multiple images of every star, and light can go into unstable circular uh, orbit at r equals 3m. And I'm almost done. Uh, I'm almost done, but I have to tell you how you're going to view these things. We assume that around you. Either you're sitting at rest or you're plunging inward. Around you is a personal planetarium. And you see a star from, you see light from beam A in a little spot here, and you take your crayon and you put a dot there. And here is star B, which is directly behind you. You put a little crayon mark there. And here's star C, and you see that. But ahead of you is the black hole. There's the upper edge of the black hole and the lower edge of the black hole. And so in front of you is going to be a cone of what the, uh, that's gonna be entirely black. Now when I make a summary of all this, I use what's called a pie chart. Here is the, here is the image of the black hole that takes up a certain uh, number of degrees. Here is the, uh, here is this, here's where I see, this is where I look to see a star, and here are some others. So this is the summary. And now I'm gonna take you to the center of a black hole. Here is the shell, he's just sitting there. And, and, and if you're, if you're 50 times, if you're 25 times the distance of, to the uh, horizon, remember the horizon is at r equals 2m, then the shell observer is going to see 12 degrees. And, well, the diver has come in from a distance and is moving past you, it's going to see t 10 degrees. At 5m, that is at two and a half times the uh, horizon, this one, the, the, a shell observer is going to see two times 54, 54 degrees this way, 54 degrees this way, and this and the diving observer will see two times 27 degrees. When you're just outside the event horizon, you, you're all you, the, the black hole wraps around you. At the event horizon, you only see the whole set of stars in a little cone out directly outward, and this is just above the event horizon. However, you're moving so fast that these stars, who, which were originally uniformly distributed, have, have now piled forward according to the, uh, in, according to the uh, uh, aberration of starlight. And this is just before you get to the center of the black hole, and you see a ring of, of stars all around you. First images, second images, third in, images, multiple images. You see a very bright ring and behind, ahead of you is the black hole. Behind you is almost without stars. There, there may be one little star that is directly outward that you still see directly behind you. And then that's all you see, and then life is over. And in two ninths of a second, you're dead. A wonderful way to die, but it's gonna be hard for you to get there because it's 30,000 light years from here. So that's sort of the story of the book. You build it around the story, you're careful to talk about coordinates as arbitrary, almost, ar almost totally arbitrary. So here is some suggested reading, Black Holes and Time Warps by Kip Thorne, which not only talks about the logic of black holes, but also the history, who did what when, a very interesting story, in including the implosion of nuclear weapons, which turned out to be an important part of understanding black holes. And here is the, uh, the you, you say, the autobiography of John Wheeler, written with Ken Ford, about his life in physics. And here are some websites. This talk and the other files with the more, many more Wheeler stories is at this website, which includes not only this talk, but the talk that, we'll, that I'll be giving as a keynote for the conference that's coming up. And if you want to do sleep, uh, Slavomir Tulea's wonderful GR orbits, here's where you go. And if you, uh, and if you want to help us with the book, you go to this website and you, and you call down the chapters and you say, I don't understand what happens in line 452. And we'll say, oh my God, of course we forgot. Thank you, thank you, thank you for it. 
And if you do enough of that, we'll put an acknowledgement in, but it has to be quite a lot. So that's the end of the story. Thank you.